everyone and welcome to this session on Kubernetes Manifest Lifecycle, uh, what it is and how to get it right. I am your host, uh, I am Ole Lansmar, CTO at KubeShop, uh, Ole at KubeShop.io. I have a background in open source and a bunch of things over many years. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, manifests. Uh, as I'm sure you're familiar, uh, Kubernetes is very much focused around manifests or YAML configuration files, as you might know them. I'm going to talk about the life cycle of manifests. I'm going to talk about um, templating manifests. I'm going to talk about some tooling, some best practices. Uh, obviously, love to answer any questions at the end. I'm going to do a little bit of a demo as well. This is a pretty high level talk. Uh, so so if you're already deep entrenched, uh, hopefully there's some new things in here for you. But if you're relatively new to Kubernetes, I hope you'll uh, you know learn a bunch of new things and uh, find some new ways to think around manifests and related workflows. So first of all, <clears throat> just jumping straight in, what are Kubernetes manifests? Uh, you know, if you want to break it down, uh, manifests are specifications of Kubernetes objects in JSON or YAML format. I'm sure you've all seen those YAML files um, that kind of describe an object that um, Kubernetes is going to manage for you once you deploy your manifest. Um, the manifests are usually it's one um, object defined per manifest file, but you can define as many objects as you want um, in your manifest files. And once you have your files, you can manage those obviously, and then you apply them to Kubernetes and Kubernetes will then try to create uh, objects in your cluster corresponding to the map. The, the configuration in the manifest file itself. Um, just basic manifest structure. I'm going to look at YAML here through the, throughout the presentation. Every manifest has a an API version and a kind at the top, which specifies which kind of object you're going to create in this example, the service. The version of the, speci uh, of the service is v1. Uh, also, a name is usually something that's required for manifests, uh, although it's not. There are some exceptions. Namespace is definitely something that is optional. This is something you use to tell Kubernetes in which namespace you want to create this object. And then maybe most important of all is the is the content related to the actual object that you're creating. And of course, this will vary depending on the type of object. So in this um, example, I'm creating a service. And uh, the content of the of the uh, manifest is the specification with ports, etc. And this can, of course, be much more lengthy and uh, complicated. This is just a simple example. Um, important to understand about versioning and schemas. Uh, as I said, the API version and kind uh, to tell uh, which schema and man of the manifest you're about to use. Um, and the schema itself uh, then defines which properties and arrays and you know types and enumerations, everything that you can use to define the state of the object that you're trying to create. And these schemas are defined using JSON schema uh, and OpenAPI. Oh, there's some limitations around what you can do. This is all, of course, documented on Kubernetes.io. Um, important here is not to confuse this version with the actual version of Kubernetes. So if you have a if you're running Kubernetes version 1.24, which I think is the latest for now, um, this supports uh, both versions v1 and v1 beta 1 of the Chrome job kind. So if we go back here, you, you have a service here, API version v1. Uh, the, your Kubernetes version might su support you know v1 and maybe an older version, but that does not really relate to the version of Kubernetes itself. And you'll have to keep an eye on uh, the Kubernetes, uh, you know, change logs to see, you know, which versions of API um, objects or manifests that uh, it supports. Uh, for example, if I had a Chrome job that was using older schema, the v1 beta 1, uh, that will remove, be removed in Kubernetes 1.25. So something to keep an eye on. And of course, if you're creating new uh, manifests, always try to use the latest version. Uh, but with the caveat, uh, make sure that that's actually the version that you're deploying to. So if you're deploying to GKE or Amazon or whatever, uh, make sure that the target Kubernetes version there supports the version uh, of the uh, manifest, uh, the objects that you're trying to create. Okay, um, moving, rushing forward. Uh, next thing to be aware of is that manifests pretty often refer to each other, right? So an object in Kubernetes does 
uh, rarely live entirely on its own. So uh, there's plenty of references in objects uh, to other objects. So just a couple of examples here. Uh, some references are purely name-based. So for example, this is a config map ref inside a deployment, uh, and it, it refl um, refers to a name uh, config map with this name here. The specific case, it's actually an optional ref. You can see optional is true. Um, other uh, very common types of refs are what's called label-based selectors. So here, for example, we have a service which applies to uh, objects or pods that have uh, labels, uh, annotations with this property name and this value. So it's a way of selecting which other objects this service applies to. And finally, um, uh, more complex object references are also common for you. So you, here you can see this is a role binding, which refers to a role by not just the name, but also the kind of object it's referring to and the API group it's referring to. And these refs can be pretty complex. Uh, and this is important to know, obviously, when you're creating your manifests and you're referring to other objects to get these right, because uh, uh, when you tr if you try to deploy these manifests and your references are wrong, they're not going to work, uh, or they might not work, at least as expected. So good to keep an eye on. One thing that um, uh, Kubernetes adds to your manifests uh, once you've deployed them is a status uh, section, uh, and usually, well, at the end uh, of the, the YAML file. And the status kind of tells you the, the current actual state of the object. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example a little later on. But so if you, this is, the status is not something you add yourself, but when you deployed your manifest and you can look at your manifest running in the, in the cluster, you'll see information on, you know, the status of the object. This will vary uh, depending on the type of object, uh, uh, depending on kind of the life cycle the object itself goes through and what kind of states or, or uh, changes or inf metadata that Kubernetes and corresponding components can provide um, for this object. But something you, <laughs> obviously good to know that if you're creating a manifest, uh, your status is not something you're expected to add by yourself. It's always added <clears throat> by Kubernetes itself. So speaking of the life cycle, let's, let's uh, take a little bit of a step back. We've talked about very high level aspects of, of Kubernetes manifests, but let's have a look at the life cycle itself of a manifest. So usually, um, you know, you'd be managing your manifests as files, uh, restoring them in Git, uh, you create them, uh, you edit your file, your manifests. Uh, there's a preview step. I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, one thing super important when you're working with manifests is to validate them. Uh, and I'll talk about more about validation and different types of validations in just a second. And then finally, you apply your manifest. And what that really means is that you're taking your YAML file or JSON uh, and uploading it to Kubernetes and telling Kubernetes, hey, this is I've described my object here. I want you to create an object uh, in the cluster corresponding to my manifest. And what Kubernetes is going to do is going to take your manifest store it in etcd, and then using its components, try to create an object uh, corresponding to the description in your manifest. And that object will then you know, go through a whole life cycle of its own, and that life cycle will vary depending on the type of object. I'm not going to drill into that here. You say that there's um, a corresponding, you know, YAML is stored in uh, Kubernetes. This is something you can debug and troubleshoot. You know, if your object is not working as you might want, you'd be looking at the YAML manifest deployed and the status that I talked about earlier, you might do some hot fixes directly in your cluster to see if that helps. Or if you're more process oriented, you might actually make changes, go back here, make changes, you know, validate them, apply them, and then see, you know, go through this loop until you've hopefully got your object in a state that is what you desired. And, you know, at the end of the day or the week or the month or the year, you'll delete the object and it'll be gone from your cluster. So very high level uh, uh, life cycle for your manifests, both outside your cluster as files, but then also inside your cluster stored inside Kubernetes. So let's just have a quick look at these steps. Um, I think creating and editing manifests is you know something that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you'd use your IDE uh, uh, to create uh, maybe a manifest. Maybe you'd copy paste from another manifest that you find online or that you use as a as a blueprint or, you know, many IDs have plugins to help you with snippets or templates um, to get started. 
Um, another way to create your manifest is to use kubectl, which is uh, you know the command line tool included with with Kubernetes, and it has some commands that will just you know by just generate vanilla manifests for you that you can then work off. I'm going to show this a little bit later on in the demo as well. Um, other ways is, of course, you could connect to your cluster and extract manifests them from there and use them as blueprints. But ultimately, these are text files that you would you know, work with in your IDEs uh, or your uh, code editors. Once you've worked with it, uh, we, let's look at validation. And validation is a super important part of manifests, uh, actually. It's something that's often overlooked. Um, I think what many people kind of do by default is, of course, syntax validation. Oops, sorry about that. Making sure that um, uh, you know the YAML syntax is correct, and your editor is definitely going to do that for you. The next thing you want to do is schema validation. So make sure that all the properties and values are in line with the target schema for the object that you're trying to create. We talked about this earlier, and here, of course, it's important to once again know which Kubernetes version are you targeting, uh, and are you using the right version of the kind of object you're trying to create, and then are all the properties and values, etc., uh, you know, compliant with the schema for that um, object. And usually uh, IDEs will help you here. Uh, for example, here I see an error because I made a, a deliberate spelling mistake. It said names here, but it should be name, and it's complaining that the volumes is missing a name. Um, Next step of validation is reference validation. This is, we talked about links to other uh, objects. And here we can see we have two links uh, referring to config maps. And this is referring, here's a link to a secret, uh, which doesn't exist in my manifest or any of my other local manifests, which is in this case marked as an error. It's also set optional false. If it was optional true, then this would pass because it's not a required reference. This can be tricky because sometimes the objects you're referring to are not in your local manifest. They are already running in your cluster. So uh, it, when if you use a tool to validate references or links and it tells you, hey, you're trying to refer to an object that doesn't exist in your local manifests, those objects might still actually exist in your cluster. So they, this might work well when you deploy. So it's something to keep, uh, be aware of um, that uh, even if the local validation fails, it might actually work in your cluster. So you'll have to kind of uh, check that or use a tool that will actually validate references against your cluster as well and not just within the uh, local files that you're working with in your ID. And finally, and I think maybe the most important, or well, uh, some, definitely something not to forget, especially when you're moving into production, is uh, policy validations. And policies are something you can define, um, uh, you know, to, in regard to a couple of aspects. So one is, you know, more local policies in the sense that you might have policies around naming, around labels, around annotations, uh, namespaces, etc. Things that are you know, specific to your project or your team. Um, other policies are maybe around performance uh, or security, and there's a bunch of tools out there that will help you validate that you're not, uh, you know, uh, making uh, to uh, creating unsecure manifests in the sense that they might have too many. The objects you're creating have uh, too high privileges, or they're using too little or too many resources, or in any other way, you know, could be um, introducing. Uh, things into your cluster that uh, are, could have a negative effect on stability uh, or integrity of your applications. So definitely uh, urge you to look at tools that do this for you. Of course, for all of these validations, there's a, a plenty of open source tools that will help you get this right. Uh, I'll mention a couple at the end. Uh, and they're easy to integrate and to use. So it's definitely something you should be doing and discussing, of course, within your team, if you're working with others, which policies are important to us, discuss with your DevOps uh, and the people who manage your infrastructure. This is maybe something they would be more concerned about uh, as they you know, put manifests and applications into production environments. Okay, moving ahead. I've created my manifests. I've uh, validated them. They're all green. I've you know fixed all security issues. Next thing is I have to actually deploy my manifest to my cluster, uh, and this is straightforward using kubectl apply. Uh, if using a tool, tools like Helm and Customize or others, uh, they, they will have you. you know, they will provide you with commands to deploy the manifest that you're using to your cluster. 
that works really well in, in the local development workflow. Eventually, though, you're going to want to automate uh, the deployment using CI CD. Uh, and if you're adventurous or if you're scaling up, uh, uh, you might be uh, looking into adopting something called GitOps, which is uh, pretty popular now. You've surely heard of tools like Argo CD and Flux uh, that can promote a GitOps workflow. Um, what GitOps boils down to is not that complicated. It, what it basically means is that you're managing all the state of your cluster, meaning all the manifests and infrastructures, code and config, um, configuration management in Git, uh, as you probably do already. And then you're using a tool to automatically synchronize those manifests or that uh, source of truth for your cluster uh, into your to your cluster itself. Um, so all the changes you make, you just push to Git uh, to your configuration, and then the tool or your CID system will make sure that your target cluster is actually uh, has the same state as the state you're describing in Git. And there's a lot of advantages here. First of all, um, you know all the, you have a record uh, of the state of your cluster. You can always recreate your clusters because nobody else is going to go, you know, like take backdoors to configure your clusters. Hopefully, uh, you can you have audit logs. You have a you know a level of security and access control to who can change what when it comes to working with configurations in your cluster. And there's a lot of great tools to help you establish these workflows uh, and uh, manage the reconciliation of what you're describing in your cluster in Git. Uh, sorry, what you're describing in Git with what you're actually running inside your cluster. Okay, now that was a, a really quick uh, overview of kind of the basic life cycle of manifests. I'm going to do a really short demo uh, of some of these things. I'm going to use a kubectl and a tool called Monocle, all free and open source. And I am handing it over to myself. Good luck, Ole. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ole. So I'm just going to do a really quick demo of um, uh, lifecycle from creation to deploy. Uh, so I'm going to start here in my command prompt and run a command to create a deployment. And this is the same command that you saw in the uh, presentation earlier. So I'm using kubectl and it's going to create a deployment for you. And I'm going to jump back over here to this monocle tool. Uh, and this is the deployment that was just created. Just, just have a quick look at that here to the right. So as you can see, while I'm trying to resize, uh, this was the YAML that was created by kubectl. You can immediately see that there are some uh, yeah, some things that aren't in line with the schema. Uh, these are marked as errors, and I'm going to actually just delete those because I don't like these errors. Um, you also see that it actually creates a status property, which it shouldn't. Uh, I'm going to remove that. Uh, for so for now, everything everything seems good from a validation point of view. I am going to enable um, validations of policies just to kind of show you what that can look like. So I've now done that, and now you can see that the default um, uh, uh, YAML created here by kubectl does actually violate a bunch of policies. Uh, related to security and performance, and I'm just going to find one of them uh, in this list of policies. Uh, this one is called, let's, let's disable all, let's enable this one. So this policy is related to uh, you, that you should specify a specific version uh, of uh, which images you're using. So if I don't, if you don't specify a version, uh, Kubernetes will always use the latest version, and this is a security, you know, a potential security issue because um, you might not know what the latest version contains. So we should be here more specific. So let's write uh, the actual version that we want to use. And as you can see now, uh, this error now went away, uh, and uh, now my uh, I've uh, created my manifest. I've edited it here. I've validated it uh, with policies. I ignored some of them. And now I am ready to deploy. So I'll just press the deploy button here and I'm going to um, just deploy this in my local um, Minikube cluster. Uh, and it's done that right now. And let's just connect to Minikube just so we can see uh, what's been created there. We can close this thing to the left. Uh, here we can see the actual uh, deployment. So this was the object that I um, applied to Kubernetes. 
Uh, now you can see that uh, Kubernetes has added a status property to it, and it's also added a bunch of other things like default property values that I didn't specify. Uh, Kubernetes will add these for you. And it's also created the actual Nginx pod for me. I can look at here. Uh, I can see the status that it's up and running and everything is all good. So, uh, and now let's just uh, end this whole thing by uh, deleting the object, deleting the deployment from my cluster, and now it's gone. And if I reload, you'll also see that uh, the Nginx pod has been removed from my cluster. So, we went through the entire lifecycle in just a couple of minutes, three and a half minutes, as I can see. Back to you, Ole. Awesome. Thank you so much for that demo, Ole. Um, now I'm going to uh, go back and look at a little bit more advanced concepts related to uh, manifests. One thing is around templating. Uh, this is something you'll, you'll pretty quickly run into. Uh, basically, let's say you have a set of manifests that you're deploying you know, to different environments, dev, dev stage, prod, but you, ha you see that there are some differences, right? You might have different uh, resource limits, you might have different network settings, you might have different namespaces um, as you deploy these manifests, but a lot of the other things are, and, and settings or properties in your manifests are the same. So you want some way to kind of have a, uh, you know, a, a core set of manifests and then uh, modify these just uh, in line with the some needs or some changes you might want to make across uh, your environments. And there's a couple of different approaches to this. Um, I'm going to look at two of them. One is uh, Customize, which uses a YAML native approach and Helm, which is not YAML native, but uh, nonetheless popular and great, um, <clears throat> just to kind of give you a high level view of your options. There are other alternatives, as always, in this <laughs> world, something called uh, CDKs or Decorate. You can generate your manifests from code. So if you prefer to write code and don't want to write YAML, there's a lot of great tools out there to help you do that and adopt that approach. It's not something I'm going to touch on here, but definitely something uh, might be worth exploring if that's kind of in line with how you want to do things. Um, let's start with Customize. Uh, customize is uh, Kubernetes native configuration management. You can go to customize.io. I think the big advantage of, of Customize are, is twofold. One is that it uses YAML for templating, so it doesn't introduce another templating language or, or format, and it's also built into kubectl, so it's pretty native to the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, what it basically does is that you have your base manifests, as I was showing in this previous slide here, and then you provide uh, what, they, what manifest called overlays or patches, uh, um, which then customize applies to these files to generate your final manifests. <laughs> so these overlays and patches would you know modify um, your base manifests as needed. They might uh, set a certain namespace or change some properties or you know whatever that you might want to do specific to a target environment. Just looking at a a, a common file structure is that you would have a base folder where you have your base manifests and then you what manifests called overlays. Uh, here's a dev and production folder. Uh, which each has a overlays for different replica accounts, and then the actual customization YAML file, which kind of tells Customize how to overlay these files onto the base uh, configuration file or manifest. I'm going to show you a very quick demo of this in just a little while. So this is one way of working. The other one is using uh, Helm. Uh, Helm has a, a, a huge following. It has a, little, a slightly different approach. So. Uh, Helm uses a custom templating language based on Go templates, uh, and Helm packages these into what's called a Helm chart, uh, maybe a term you've heard. And a Helm chart produces a Kubernetes manifests when you run or deploy a Helm chart. And Helm charts are parameterized using values files, which are YAML files, which can provide any properties that as input that uh, these templates use. And these Helm charts are usually distributed through Helm repositories. Uh, you can go online. There's uh, Artifactory, I think, is, is a big one where you can find Helm charts for you know, um, most of the common uh, applications. Everything from Minecraft to MySQL uh, have Helm charts, so it's really easy to deploy them into your cluster. But ultimately, Helm takes these templates, uh, takes the configuration files, uh, processes disease, and creates manifests, plain manifests as output, and that's what you then apply to your cluster. 
Just a quick look at the file structure of a Helm chart. You have a chart YAML file, which is the metadata file for your chart, licenses, etc. I think the important thing is the templates folder uh, where you have your actual templates. Uh, as I said, these are Go templates, but they could also actually be vanilla manifests that don't uh, do any interpolation of configuration values. Once again, I'm going to show you a quick example for the download. Um, ultimately, uh, customize in Helm. Um, uh, are, are, are tools that kind of solve the same thing, but you can really, uh, something that is more increasingly common is to use these two together. So they're not uh, inherently um, opposed to each other. Uh, and a common approach is to use uh, Helm for packaging your applications and, and um, uh, providing uh, configuration that's specific to the application itself. Uh, so if you're building an application internally, you would package all your um, components uh, that you want to deploy into Kubernetes in your Helm chart, and you'd add configuration values related to the application itself. And then once you, um, you've used your Helm chart to create that, you can then, your DevOps team, your SREs, can then use Customize to overlay any uh, configurations that are specific to the infrastructure, which you wouldn't be aware of when you're building the Helm chart. So this is actually a, a really nice approach, right? So you'd, uh, as a, the application developer, you'd create your Helm chart and make sure that that has a nice self-contained packaging. And then uh, once once this gets deployed, uh, your infrastructure team can use Customize to, you know, set uh, security settings or work with secrets or network configurations, etc that would ultimately fit this application into the infrastructure. Um, if we're thinking again about the, the life cycle, uh, how does this kind of fit in? And if you remember initially, I had a, a preview step, uh, and this is uh, in the life cycle, and this is super important, I think, is that when you're using Customize or Helm or any other uh, tools, is that you, before you apply them, that you you preview the output of those tools and then validate that output. So similar to the validations that we talked about um, earlier, uh, that you run policy, specifically policy validations and maybe link reference validations against what Customize or Helm um, creates for you before you deploy that to your cluster. And this is pretty common if you, um, that you'll find uh, maybe policy specifically around security issues uh, in these um, manifests that are generated for common tools. And this is just because people, the you know, the, the teams that create those tools don't really know what your policy or security requirements are. This is the nice part where your infrastructure team can then take that output from Helm or customize and then further uh, customize it <laughs> and add security settings, etc. So just going back here, what I'm, what I've, to kind of put that into context. So you'd create your manifests before and you'd work with your templates um, and then you would preview the output of, you know, the templating engine that you're using, you'd validate that output and then you would apply it instead of blindly, you know, asking Helm and Customize to deploy uh, to your cluster, which is the common approach and it'll, I'm sure it'll work in most of the times, but especially if you're looking into production, uh, uh, deploying into production, having adding that additional validation step it can be a huge life saver and time saver uh, when it comes to debugging. Okay, uh, I am going to hand it over to myself again for a short demo, uh, this time with Customize and also a little bit of Helm. Um, and I will be back. Good luck with the demo, Ole. Thank you, Ole. Uh, just a really quick demo of uh, Customize and Helm. So I've opened a customization here from the customize examples of repository or folder in the customize repository. Uh, and this is an LDAP server. You can see here to the left, the base folder can containing some basic uh, manifests, um, a deployment, a uh, service, and then you can see overlays for production and staging. So if we look in here, you can see that the production uh, has uh, an overlay for the deployment and um, staging also has a different overlay where the, there are diff there's a different replica setting. Uh, and so what's interesting for me to do here is, for example, if I want to see what would I actually be deploying in production, I can use this preview functionality here. And now I can see the actual objects generated by Customize. So I can see the 
a deployment, a config map that was generated, and the service. I can also see these links here between the objects um, uh, that are referred to each other, uh, and I'm not getting any errors or anything like that. Uh, as before, I can turn on OPA validation, uh, and here I am going to see a bunch of errors, once again, related to security policies that aren't set in these uh, uh, manifests. So that might be a good uh, cue for me to fix those before I deploy anything. Uh, but let's disable those and go back here. So that was a you know a really really quick uh, a view of of customize and let's just have a really quick view of Helm as well. We're going to look at a Hello World a Helm chart uh, in uh, Amazon's example repository. So let's go over here. Here's the actual chart YAML file. You see there's not very much there. There's one template. So there's only one um, template file in this Helm chart. And you can see here that it uses kind of the Go template syntax to um, you pull values from uh, a values file uh, that's specified here, which has some custom properties. And I'm going to do the same thing here, use this preview button to see the objects that uh, Helm would generate if I run use this Helm chart. Uh, so here I can see that using Helm with this template, with this values file, would have generated these two manifests uh, or these two objects, uh, this deployment and this service. You can see once again, no errors, everything lines up neatly when it comes to links, etc. Just for the fun of it, I'm gonna enable the OPA policies. And once again, you're gonna see um, security and performance related uh, warnings, uh, which I should probably fix if I wanted to deploy this into production. But of course, as for learning purposes, uh, these are something that I can blissfully ignore. Uh, okay, that was a, a super quick demo of templating and what that could look like with both customize and help. And now back to you, Ole. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I uh, hope that gives you a little bit of insight into how Customize and Helm work. Um, let's just wrap up uh, about tooling. We talked about, um, hope this isn't too confusing. So we have the, uh, the lifecycle steps here and here we have a different types of tools. So KubeCuddle is great for creating and applying uh, objects. I think the, the common uh, or the you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction would be to use your IDE. And IDEs are, are great uh, for editing, obviously, but usually they rely on plugins for many of the other features. Um, some of those plugins might be bundled, might, some of them might be third-party. Uh, the risk here is, of course, that the plugins themselves aren't very aligned uh, and maybe not well integrated. So you'll have to kind of figure that out and, you know, you, and, and choose and install and learn each plugin and see how you can get them to provide you with a nice workflow. Validation tools, there's Trivi, Cubescape, Cubeval, there's name it. If you search Google it, you'll find many, many obviously apply to the validation phase. Um, and some of them provide plugins for uh, your IDEs as well. So can easily be integrated there. Talked about Helm and Customize, um, obviously for creating, previewing, applying, not for editing. That's where you would use your IDEs once again. And then you have a bunch of cluster tools, lenses, you know, uh, K9S, there are others. These tools are great for working uh, with manifests once they have been deployed in your cluster. They're not um, huge on uh, the the earlier phases when it comes to working with files. They might, some of them might have the ability to apply, um, but so there should probably be next year, uh, but they are very much focused on working with your cluster, which is great. And they're great at that. And then finally, uh, there are a couple of specialty tools out there, um, you know, claiming to be like Kubernetes IDEs. Uh, basically the goal of these is to um, uh, really provide an integrated workflow for what I've been talking about, right? So instead of you having to pick and match plugins and, and trying to get those work together, um, uh, tools like Monocle will kind of provide, you know, an integrated and hopefully more productive experience. But usually um, they are still built on the same validation tools and Helm and Customize. So it's, it's more of providing an, a UI and the workflow on top of uh, tools that are already out there. So uh, usually I think you would start with kubectl, maybe your IDE, you'd throw in, you know, a validation tool, you'd start using Helm and Customize and maybe use uh, a cluster tool. And then you'd have kind of this mishmash of tools that work well together. 
Uh, and then as you move forward, you might be saying, you know, I don't have the energy or time to always keep all of these different things up to date. To date. Well, how about uh, giving these kind of tools a try that it just makes you more productive right from the start. But obviously it's up to you. Uh, well, uh, have our preferences there. So finally, best practices. Um, Understanding manifest in our life cycle is important. Uh, use the sta latest stable API version. Mention this uh, for your manifests. Keep your manifest simple. Don't over, you know, overly specify default values. This could be a security risk. Um, the, you know, the easier they are to read, the easier it will be for others to manage them. Use templating systems. Uh, use them wisely. And what I mean there is, don't, you know, throw yourself into complex Helm or customized setups until you actually need them. Uh, it, 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 try to keep it simple is always good, at least initially. Validation is super important and try to automate that if you, as much as you can. Use you know, tools like uh, uh, the ones I've mentioned uh, for validating and automating the validation of, of your manifests before you deploy them to your cluster. The, uh, spend so much time debugging things in your cluster, you know, hours of why is this not working when uh, just a simple validation pre-deployment would have figured out that oh you got this you spelled this name wrong uh, and you're referring to a config map that doesn't exist or something like that and then finally i did mention GitOps. GitOps is awesome and it's it, it, it's a fantastic approach to managing cluster state uh, it is though uh, something that's pretty complex and it requires kind of buy-in from your entire team. Right? It's not something that one person can do <laughs> and then the rest can do uh, work as, as uh, you know, just more manually. It's something that your whole team adopts uh, and there are workflows related to that. So make sure everyone understands that and kind of uh, aligns with the benefits and, uh, uh, and then uh, before you adopt a GitOps workflow. And that's it. Uh, I hope that was uh, somewhat insightful. Um, happy to stick around and answer some questions. You can always reach me at Ole at kubeshot.io. Thank you so much for listening and have a great conference. Goodbye, everyone.